Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Living Earth Collaborative Seminar. Today it is my extreme pleasure to welcome Dr. Fernando Nahara, who is joining us from the St. Louis Zoo as a postdoctoral fellow with the Canid Conservation Initiative collaboration that includes the St. Louis Zoo, Washington University in St. Louis, and the Endangered Wolf Center. Dr. Nahara is a wildlife veterinarian who earned both his veterinary degree and PhD in wildlife physiology at the University of Madrid. Before enrolling in his PhD program, he worked in zoos and wildlife rehabilitation centers in Spain and Ecuador. During his pre-doctoral research, he served as a field veterinarian for the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit at Oxford University, leading the capture and chemical immobilization of free-ranging sundra cloud lepers in Malaysian Borneo. During this time, he also served as the veterinary manager for the Thailand Cloud Leopard Consortium and extra ex situ uh, captive breeding program for mainland clouded leopards and fishing cats and also perform clinical evaluations of captive cloud leopards at different facilities in Borneo and Indonesia. And then before coming to the St. Louis Zoo in August, he served as the field manager for Wolf Conservation Project in Idaho, completed an internship in zoological, exotic, and wildlife medicine at the Oklahoma State University and led the disease surveillance program for the Iberian Lynx Reintroduction Project and um, in the southwestern and central and south central parts of Spain. Dr. Nahara is passionate and devoted to the field of wildlife and zoological medicine with a special interest in free ranging carnivore medicine and conservation. And it is my extreme pleasure to welcome my friend and colleague. Um, so thank you, Fernando, for joining us today. And I can't wait to hear what you have to tell us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. I'm gonna start sharing the presentation. Thank you so much, Liz. I really appreciate your, your introduction. I'm really, really excited to be here today to talk uh, about two of the things that I'm more passionate about, and it's veterinary science and uh, carnival conservation. This is the outline of my presentation. So today I'll talk a little bit about vets and their role in conservation. Then I will try to convince you all how cool carnivores are. Then I will pass and, and talk about two personal cases, examples of my previous veterinary work with two endangered species. And I will end the presentation with my actual, my current work here in Missouri. During this presentation, I will talk much about uh, conservation and carnival conservation. But the truth is that these are not good times for any of the species inhabiting planet Earth. Our planet is on crisis and now it's time to take care of it. You may see here, there are many sets that uh, affect biodiversity and, and the health of our planet. And it's in our hands to act now to avoid something irreversible. And this is scenario of biodiversity loss, pandemics, mass extinctions, climate change, it is mandatory to include a transdisciplinary approach to reverse this situation. More than 20 years ago, some pioneer wildlife vets already stressed the need to include veterinary science into conservation. When we talk about wildlife conservation related to veterinary science, we may divide this big piece into ex situ and in situ programs. As you may read, some of the veterinary tasks are really similar. And sometimes the information gathered from one program may inform the other one and vice versa. We will relate to these roles as the presentation follows. 
So carnivorous species belong to the order carnivora, which is the fifth largest mammalian order. There are 250 species from different form and shapes. The smallest terrestrial predator is the least whistle, which weighs 10,000 less times than the biggest terrestrial predator, the polar bear. They all inhabit every land man on earth. Carnivores are really cool. They really are because of the ecosystem services that they provide. In this slide, you may see seven species of large carnivores with documented ecological effects involving tritrophic cascades from large carnivores to prey to plants, mesopredator cascades from large carnivores to mesopredators to prey of mesopredators. In some ecosystems, large carnivores may enhance carbon storage by limiting the numbers of the herbivore prey, thus allowing plants, all of which absorb and store CO2, to flourish. They also are involved in biodiversity enhancement, the reestablishment of native plant diversity, and the riparian, riparian restoration. The presence of large carnivores in the landscape offers indirect benefits as well. One of them is presented in this research where wolves in Wisconsin control economic damages from overabundant deer in ways that human deer hunters cannot. In this research, wolf entry reduced these vehicle collisions by 24%. Most of the reduction is due to a behavioral response of deer to wolves, what is called the landscape of fear, rather than through a deep population decline from wolf predation. Large carnivores help reduce disease prevalence in ungulate prey populations by mitigating agricultural costs because of a spillover effects on domestic livestock. In this beautiful example, the presence of Iberian wolves in the ecosystem controls the spread and prevalence of tuberculosis. This is another example of how large carnivores may benefit our health. Gravies kills nearly 20,000 people just in India do mainly to feral dogs' bites. In Mumbai, leopards consume nearly 1,500 feral dogs per year, reducing injury rates and potentially saving approximately 90 human lives. But what happens when the let when the large carnivore disappears from the landscape? Do mesocarnivores have a role in the ecosystem? Simple ecological communities represent systems in which the community effects of mesocarnivores may be more prominent. Those interactions in these communities may be linear, strong, and lacking compensation. California Channel Islands are a good example to observe the ecosystem role of mesocarnivores. In two of these islands, we may find two sympatric mesocarnivores, the island fox and the island spotted skunk. Both carnivores feed on deer mice. Mice are significant seed predators of the silver lupine and could affect lupine population dynamics. Lupine are important nitrogen fixing plants that alter soil properties. What happens when an invasive top predator arrives? Golden eagles were attracted to the California Channel Islands because of the abundance of pigs. Eagles also hunted the diurnal island fox, but had minimal impact on the nocturnal skunk. Foxes 
are competitively superior to skunks, so that when foxes decline, skunk populations increase. In those islands with just foxes, the decline of these species translated into a tenfold increase or more of the deer mice affecting the silver lupine. Let's explore other roles of mesocarnivores. In Spain, some mesocarnivores are known to be seed dispersers of a common fleshy fruity tree, the Prunus mahalet. Birds tended to disperse seeds short distances, less than 250 meters, than mesocarnivores that can disperse seeds up to one kilometer. In some fragmented ecosystems, the role of apex mesocarnivores like coyotes may benefit the songbirds since they control populations of smaller predators like raccoons, possums, or even domestic cats. In this last case, not only by killing domestic cats, but by changing the behavior of humans, changing some human habits, like bringing cats inside the house at night. But this doesn't mean that larger predators, mesopredators may replace the ecological function of apex predators. Only complex predators communities can mitigate the effects of mesopredators and invasive predators. So can mesocarnivores be guardians as well of our health? This here is probably one of the most known examples. This article illustrates how reductions in small mammal predators can sharply increase Lyme disease risk. So changes in predator communities may have cascading impacts that facilitate the emergence of zoonotic diseases. Mesocarnivores and carnivores in general may contribute to our health by means of the predator-related dilution effect. This dilution effect is based in three documented and proved hypotheses. The density reduction hypothesis, meaning that predators regulate host populations. Secondly, predators may choose infected individuals to prey on. And lastly, um, the risk activity hypothesis, where prey may alter its behavior to avoid predation, thus altering disease dynamics. This predator-related dilution effect is part of something bigger, the dilution effect on how biodiversity protects us, which brings us again to this first slide, to our first slide, when I stressed the need of taking care of our planet. But sadly, carnivores are in trouble. Almost all of them share the same threats. The primary threat to most carnivores is the combined loss of habitat and prey. Let's see an example. I just need to kill about 50 medium or lat ungulates a year to survive. In natural functioning ecosystems, this represents about 10% of available prey. That is, a population of 500 prey animals is required to sustain a single tiger. And imagine a tiny population of just 10 tigers that requires 5,000 prey animals to survive, not accounting the needs for the sympathetic carnival community. This translates into the main problem for large carnivals. They need large tracts of suitable habitat with abundant prey populations. High in the list as indirect threats are retaliation killing due to livestock predation, trophy hunting, and poaching. 
Human activities such as hunting affect long-term population persistence in some carnivores, such as the felidae, by disrupting sex-related patterns of spatial dynamics. But not only hunting affect felidae population's persistence. Other human drivers, such as urbanization, fragmentation, can cause long-term population consequences for these species by altering male and female behavior. Another threat is well reflected by Is lion is suffering serious neurological signs due to an infection of canine distemper virus. This virus was traumatic for the population of lions and other wild carnivores in the 70s in the 90s. Other example of infectious diseases as threat for endangered carnivore populations are found here. For example, carnivore, canine distemper virus, plague, rabies, or feline leukemia virus. Well, when we think in climate change as a threat for carnivores, I bet we all have the same species in mind, right? the polar bears. Global warming is considered the largest long-term threat for polar bears. The short-term threat is still over harvesting. But there are many more species affected by climate change. Another carnival is the wolverine. This species is already threatened by habitat conversion, over harvesting, illegal killing, predator control programs, apart, apart from these ones, and since these species strongly depends on snow cover for reproduction, climatic warming is predicted to reduce suitable habitat and fragment populations. Climate change may affect the distribution and abundance of certain parasites. This may be the case of Toxoplasma condai that can be dramatic for the palace cats. These two do not get along. The steam susceptibility of palace cat to Toxoplasmosis is a consequence of evolving in a biologically unique environment. Palace cats inhabit areas with extreme severe winters. The Toxoplasma gondai or sites have poor survivorship at both extreme temperatures and high altitudes. So the combination of limited numbers of definitive hosts and low oocyte survival during the winter months could impair the ability of Toxoplasma gondii to complete its natural life cycle and persist in the wild. So contact rates between Toxoplasma and Pallas cats are low. If winters get milder in these areas, facilitating the survival of Toxoplasma gondii all sites, the consequences of higher contact rates between Toxoplasma gondii and palate cats would be unpredictable. So we come back again to this to the need of taking care of our planet and all species because they will take care of us in return. It is not too late to take, to take care of our carnivores as well. We will need to focus on preserving land, prey, and putting into practice all available tools for coexistence. Now we move on to study two specific cases where vets play a relevant role for the conservation of this of endangered species. In this case, the Varian lynx and Sunda Cabodelepat. To study the Iberian lynx, we need to travel to my beloved Spain and Portugal. The Iberian lynx is a medium-sized felid with males weighing between 12 and 15 kilos and females between 9 to 12 kilos. 
They are endemic just to the Iberian Peninsula and they are trophic specialists meaning that up to 90% of its diet is composed by the European wild rabbit. Still one of the most, if not the most, endangered feeling species on Earth. So the relevance of these species relies on the fact that they are considered flagship, umbrella, and keystone species. As a flagship species, this cat is able to attract the attention and interest of the general public. As an umbrella species, this felid is linked to a very particular ecosystem, the Mediterranean forest. So when we create conservation measures for its conservation, indirectly, we then protect the whole biodiversity included in this particular ecosystem. As a keystone species, well, the ecological fate of this species has an impact over other species. When lynxes disappear, something called the mesopredator release occurs that's having a profound impact in other keystone species, the European wild rabbit, which is the prey of many, many carnivores in this particular ecosystem. So what are the main threats for this apex carnival? Prey depletion. So in numbers of wild rabbits plummet, lynx will be strongly negatively affected. Destruction, alteration, fragmentation of the Mediterranean scrublands. Anthropogenic causes such as poaching or road killing. And diseases. How do all these threats affect the distribution of Iberian lynxes? In the 60s, we could find lynxes almost in the whole southern half of the Iberian Peninsula. But the demographic situation couldn't be more critical for the Iberian lynx in the early 2000s, with less than 100 individuals into a small population nuclei. To reverse this situation, in 2014, the reintroduction program began and four areas were identified as suitable habitat for agrarian lynx. In this slide, you may see the difference in lynx distribution between 2002 and 2015. So, our lynxes, our Iberian lynxes, more prone to disease. Let's explore this. Over their life history, lynxes have suffered for severe genetic bottlenecks, which has resulted in low genetic diversity, making these species more susceptible to disease. We are still we're still having low numbers, so any kind of disease outbreak may have drastic consequences. Lynxes coexist with other and more abundant carnivores that may play a role as disease reservoirs. All of these could put lynxes in a really scary scenario. Scenario of disease-induced extinction. So let's play a relevant role during the reintroduction, where at the beginnings, the numbers of the individuals released are still very low. For example, we perform physical examinations previous to the reintroductions. These exams serve to ensure an optimal health status in each individual to be released. We make sure that the individual do not carry any infectious diseases, that they do not have any physical injuries that may affect the survival once they are released. 
the insects are a subject of physical examinations once they are reproduced. We check for any clinical sign of disease, infectious or not infectious. We test for a wide spectrum of infectious diseases that may cause morbidity or mortality. And we take advantage of these examinations to also replace the wrong colors. They are subject to vaccination protocols. One of the most relevant infectious diseases for this species that we took down is the feline leukemia virus. In 2007, an outbreak of feline leukemia virus had devastating consequences in one subpopulation of Tanyana, one of the last two strongholds at the time, that killed two thirds of the infected individuals. We believe that one of the main causes of this was the low genetic diversity of that population at that time. So I've always been intrigued about what would be a fair vaccination threshold to achieve herd immunity. So I team up with a mathematician to develop a susceptible infected recovered model to explore the R0 and calculate the herd immunity for our lynxes based in the data from the 2007 feline leukemia virus outbreak. Results obtained from this model express that this virus transmission was more aggressive than occurring in domestic cats. This may be explained due to the Doniana population traits at that time where a low genetic diversity and high inbreeding rate could have led to a compromised immunocompetence that would have facilitated disease spread. Based in this model, a critical vaccination level of 54% would have been enough to achieve herd immunity threshold. This vaccination coverage could be considered in reproduction programs to avoid feline leukemia virus transmission and dissemination in case of an outbreak emergence in these newly established populations. As veterinarians, we take care of any emergency that may arise during the reintroduction. Individuals showing any signs of disease, such as poor body condition, are subject to capture and examination. Another typical example is interspecific aggression, like this individual and the typical lesions associated with this kind of interactions. Less common are factors like in this slide showing this case of these juvenile links. And another emergency is when lynxes visit chicken coops and they get a stack. They may visit chicken coops because they are impaired to hunt, like the case of the left, or just because they are lazy to hunt and they want just a free meal, like the case of the right. So the vet team needs to assess its situation. Necropsies represent a great opportunity to investigate disease-induced mortality and pay attention to overlooked infectious diseases that are not initially included in the routine active or disease surveillance, and once identified, may become part of the target surveillance. Screening for infectious diseases in the sympathetic cannibal community plays an important role during the restoration of any carnival. We perform an infectious disease screening before the reintroduction to evaluate the disease risk at the release site. We keep doing so during the reintroduction to observe patterns of disease a long time and to detect the emergence of disease that may have an impact on the lynx populations. Personally, I love to study the intragill aggression or intragill predation as a mechanism of disease transmission between carnivores. As lynxes regulate the population of other mesocarnivores, this represents a suitable scenario for disease transmission. 
We also perform disease surveillance in prey species and sympathetic ungulates. These cases were really, really concerned always any infectious diseases that may affect the European wild rabbits, such as the new variant, the new strain of the rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus that decimated rabbit populations in many areas occupied by lynxes. Apart from the biological pieces of a restoration project, the social perception is key to ensure the success of the program. Without social support, the reintroduction program will fail. Personally, I like to be involved in this conversation with the general public and the stakeholders. The very first task is to identify potential conflicts. If there is an unresolved conflict, illegal killing or trapping may occur, affecting the future establishment of the species. So, in our case, one of the main conflicts is the competition for the small game between hunters and lynxes. Once the conflict is identified, then we implement an education program with all the stakeholders involved. We always use science-based education to give documented facts to all stakeholders. In this case, we have proved that having lynxes in the landscape may decrease all the mesocarnival populations up to 80%, which will result in an increase of the small game, which is a win-win situation. We know that some of our stakeholders do not like science as much. So then we provide other evidence of the ecological role of lynxes in regards of controlling other carnivores. Only in this manner, we will get the much needed social support to ensure the success of the program. Though lynxes still face a high number of threats, thanks to the support and work of all stakeholders involved, this species is currently reversing its previous decline. And in 2015, the IUCN downlisted the Iberian lynx from critically endangered to endangered. And in 2021, we are celebrating that numbers of lynxes are over the 1,100 individuals. So future generations will enjoy the presence of the Iberian lynx in the landscape. Now we travel a little bit further to study Sunda clouded leopards. We move to the rainforest of Borneo, which support a unique guild of five fillets. Sunda clouded leopard, the flat headed cat, the leopard cat, the marble cat, and the Bornean bay cat. But today I'll focus just in Sunda Cloud and Leopards. Historically, Sunda Cloud and Leopards have been considered as a subspecies of the mainland Cloud and Leopard. Recent genetic and morphological studies have shown that clouded that Sunda Cloud and Leopards are distinct species per se. One of the main differences we may find it in the pattern of the coat, mainland cloud and leopards have lighted and lighted rosettes that Sunda cloud leopards. While the mainland cloud leopards has a wide distribution all over Southeast Asia, the Sunda cloud leopard is restricted to just the islands of Borneo and Sumatra. There are some features that make this species unique within the Felidae family. They are considered as the saber-toothed cats of nowadays. Within the Felidae family, cloud and leopards have the longest canines in relation with the size of the skull. 
Anatomically, they are just amazing. The ankle joints may rotate up to 180 degrees, facilitating all type of acrobatics in the trees. There are just two other species with similar boreal habits in the Felidae family, margays and marble cats. As it occurs with all the carnivores around the world, the loss of habitat and forest fragmentation represents the main threat for these species as well. We have passed from seeing the pristine rainforest in Borneo to desolated landscapes, the oil palm plantations. Poaching and illegal killing represents another threat. And activity, this scenario is not looking great. The active population of mainland cloud leopards is almost not sustainable and needs genetic augmentation. This is because now the leopards are considered one of the most difficult species to breed in activity due to severe male aggression, low compatibility between pairs, and high mortality rate in pairs. In the wild, just a handful of mainland clouded leopards have been cored, and there are no accurate surveys data on numbers. In the wild, cloud leopards may perfectly serve as an umbrella species. Protecting these species entirely protects the many other species that make up the ecological community of its habitat. In order to understand the biology and ecology of Sunda cloud leopards, a research program was created that also included a veterinary research component. The main goal was to gain as much knowledge as possible in order to create conservation tools to protect them. So the canary research was focused on capture and chemical immobilization, gathering baseline health data and biochemistry, serum biochemistry and metology, studied the, study the physiological impact of capture and disease is screening in these populations. But today we we'll focus just in the capturing chemical immobilization, just the more fun part. The objectives of the capture and chemical immobilization are to investigate the safety and efficacy of trapping methodologies and the safety and efficacy of drug combinations. So our study involved captive and free-living Sunda cloud leopards. Locating captive, captive individuals was quite challenging because captive population is unknown. There are no species survival plan. There are no endangered species program. There's no stud books. We performed surveys using the internet, which is now reliable. And we travel a lot, visiting local zoos, while the rescue centers, while the rehabilitation centers, to at the end find just maybe more of a handful of individuals in Malaysia, Borneo, and Indonesia, in Java. Locating free ranging individuals was even more challenging. We used camera traps that allow us to identify individuals thanks to their unique pattern of the coat. Camera trapping in Borneo can be tricky. We had to deal with a couple of unexpected problems, such as big tail macaques stealing camera traps, the little thief, or some bears having a blast playing with our cameras and new toes. So we did not detect cloud leopards in oil palm plantation or small forest fragments, which is not surprising. So our light trapping operations focused on two main protected areas of Northern Borneo, Nanu Valley Conservation Area and the Lower Kinabatanga Wildlife Sanctuary. So for our cage trap locations, we rely on camera trapping, and footprints, scat findings, and although rare, on visual sightings as well. Like this video. Like this. 
Cardinals. This is stunning, stunning thing. I will never get out of this. So we used single door or double door cage traps baited with like prey, chickens, hens, rabbits. We used as well carcass of natural prey. We use urine from active on specifics. And we also use decoys. But life trapping in Borneo is not easy in either. Big me elephants made our lives a little bit more difficult, but we forgave them because they are just too cute. But the hard work paid off, and after several months of light trapping, we captured the very first Sunda cloud leopard. So once trapped, we approach from a distance to assess its suitability for the anesthesia and estimate its body weight. We saw the bat aiming for the large muscles of the hind limbs. Once down, the animal is taken out of the trap, placed in a shady area, the anesthesia monitoring began. We take biological samples and then we place the radio collars. After a working time of 60, 70 minutes, the animals were placed back into the cages to monitor their recovery. And they were released back into the wild once they didn't show any signs of the immobilization. We recognize the limitations of our research based on the low numbers of individuals sampled the long time consumed in trapping wildlife individuals, our limited funding and difficulties to get some of the drugs to the islands. Despite the limitations, we were able to accomplish our mission and shed some light into the veterinary management of the species. But most importantly, we were part of the biggest picture, having radio collar individuals for the very first time allow us to understand the line used in a fermented landscape and to highlight the forest dependence of these species. This informs about the critical value of the forest canopy in the natural history of the species and the conservation. We need to keep walking towards the conservation of this faith, maintaining its kingdom to gift us with pictures like this one or videos like these. This stunning male. So nowadays, I'm changing gears to study the native Caney Gill in Missouri. I'm part of the Caney Conservation Initiative, which is a collaborative effort between the St. Louis Zoo, Washington University in St. Louis, and the Endangered World Center. In this program, we will study the spatial ecology and health of the native canids in two distinct ecological landscapes. A rural landscape, Tyson Research Center, it's a wonderful place, and a suburban landscape, the St. Louis Zoo Wiker Park, which is very interesting as well. This program will highlight the role of native canids, sentinels for ecosystem health. We will study some zoonotic diseases such as rabies or leptospirosis, canid diseases like parvovirus, canine distemper virus, among others, big bone diseases such as hardland and bovine viruses, thanks to our WashU collaboration, among other big bone diseases, and environmental pollutants such as rabies. To accomplish this, we will carry out light trapping operations to sample canids and sympathetic carnivores. And we will deploy telemetry devices in the target species. 
our field work just started and we are now privating the trap sites. And I'd like to share with you our very first carnival videos, like this one of coyotes checking privating trap sites. Or this other one, showing the interaction of a fox and a brave possum. Or this last one, you may see a bobcat with dinner in its mouth. So I don't have too much information to share at this time. So please stay tuned. Well, finally, I'd like to thank all the colleagues and friends from all institutions that have worked with me along the years. I have made possible this entire presentation to all of them. Thank you so very much. And thank you as well to my kind host, Liz, Matt, and William. They're really, really awesome people. Thank you so very much. Well, thank you so much, Fernando. I, uh, I mean, I have to say you have me beat in uh, cute animal photos because <laughs> um, I don't. I think I don't think I can ever compete with uh, the adorable carnivore baby photos. Um, I wanted to ask you about the kind of impacts of human wildlife conflict and how that, I mean, you showed some videos um, or some images of the, the lynx and kind of like the lynx going after the chickens and possibly, I guess there were like some leg traps because I think one of the video, one of the images had a, a lynx that was missing a, um, a leg, how, how much are they going into suburban areas? Um, and is that a concern with bringing back these, these populations? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question, Liz. So we need large tracts of suitable habitat for the lynxes, right? But this is almost impossible. These all fragmented landscapes, they are all roads, they are human settlements. So we need to provide them with, with the, the most uh, um, optimal scenario for them. But that means that they will encounter these chicken coops of other, other human settlements with other problems. So we'll try to, to attack this front in advance. So we try to get into those areas where this conflict may occur, and we try to have these conversations with the stakeholders, with these chicken coop owners. So in case they have problems with, with lynxes in the chicken coops, so we try to offer any kind of replacement of, the, of, of chickens, of other prey items to avoid conflict. Well, we want to work one-on-one -on -one with these people because they really are important to be on our side. So we need to understand their needs as well. And then were there similar human wildlife conflicts going on with the, snow, with the leopards? Is there, or are the, the leopards so removed from kind of interacting with people because they're in such different types of habitat? So that's a, that's a good question, Liz, because exactly. So uh, how the leopards need more pristine scenarios to, to survive. So eventually they're going to encounter human settlements, but they are not, uh, these uh, encounters are not as frequent with another with another species moreover because they are unable to to live in near oil palm plantations and they cannot find prey in the, in, in those lands, landscapes so I think the encounters are are pretty are pretty rare but there are always being conflict but humans 
try to encroach habitat of carnivores and actually they try to compete with them with uh, the prey species, right? With ungulates in this case. So that's a, a conflict, a conflict. Yeah. And, and sometimes with these humans want the same things as uh, the carnivores. Carnivores have all, all, the, all, all the, the bad news on, on, the, on this side. Great. Well, thank you, Fernando, for a really fascinating talk. We have a question here from Anna Wassel, who asks, do you believe that increased deforestation may have a connection slash causal relationship to an increased probability of novel or emerging diseases that threaten these species? That's a wonderful, that's a wonderful question. I do believe there is a possibility that deforestation may cause um, uh, this scenario with emergence of newly diseased uh, or pathogens to, to these carnivores. Mm -hmm. So in, in our experience, um, what I'm more worried about is when we have these deforestation areas and we have human settlements and they bring their pets, dogs, cats alike. So that's probably providing a, a good uh, transmission disease risk scenario between these carnivores and, and the domestic, domestic pets. We have another question here from John Brigham. Uh, he says, you mentioned dogs, rabies, and leopards in Mumbai and showed a lion with distemper. This raises a question, aren't the carnivals all, carnivores also susceptible to rabies? Um, the, the lynx and the, the leopards, aren't they also susceptible? Absolutely, absolutely. We are lucky in Spain, so we are all uh, we have only imported cases of, of rabies coming usually from Morocco in the cases, right? So in the in the sympathetic carnivore community uh, in the Iberian Lynx uh, landscape, there are no cases of, of rabies. So that's one less concern that we have uh, on the Iberian League side. And it's really not explored in mainland cloud leopards, but in Sunda cloud leopards, at least in Borneo, Borneo is a rabies free island. So we don't have to worry about that disease neither, but probably we have to worry about other ones. A question that came to mind while watching your talk, I, I know that your local work is still in its preliminary stages, but I'm curious whether you have any idea what applied conservation campaigns might result from your work. Do you, do you think reintroduction efforts or vaccination campaigns for Missouri's local canids may be in the future? So talking about reintroduction, so the red wolf, comes up uh, to my mind, right? And because was was actually from Missouri. So having at least a baseline data about the diseases that are now occurring in Missouri may provide an idea of what diseases we have to take care of in advance in, in the future, the reintroduction program of red wolves or other cannibals, I don't see other ones, but may play, may play into place. So yeah, I think it's gonna be really interesting to know what kind of diseases are already in the landscape and it's gonna provide us with this much needed baseline uh, infectious disease data to actually uh, have this information in case we're gonna bring uh, other species into, into the ecosystem. Well, thank you so much for, for talking with us today and sharing your research. And I'm really excited to, to see where, where this goes. Um, and hopefully we'll get a little follow-up at some point. Okay. So with that, um, thank you everybody on YouTube for joining us and we will hopefully see you next week. Thank you.